Yeah. All right, folks. Welcome back to the channel. Christian Williams here, better known as Secret Hacker. Uh, I'm trying something different this week. Uh, you might remember the first workshop Wednesday video was recorded. I think I've got enough equipment here in the workshop to do a live stream. So we're going to see how this goes today. If uh, you're tuning in right now, I kind of did, but I didn't want to let a lot of people know this was happening so that uh, I could make mistakes and people would notice. Uh, but they'll see it eventually. And, um, you know, actually, I want to just see how this all works. If there's any issues with volume or anything else, let me know in the comments. Of course, ask any questions you might have uh, about Hickory Golf stuff, and I'll try to get to those. I've got some already, um, from other videos that I'm going to answer in this video. Um, and, and, yeah, just in general, I wanted to do this on a regular basis, especially during the winter. It'll give me something fun to look forward to when it's cold out and rain and snowy and all that up here in New England. So, um, yeah, I'm, I've got my phone nearby. If there's any questions or comments, no. hold on. Yeah, got phone calls coming in that I didn't expect. So, um, anyway, yeah, we're just going to see how this goes. Um, and uh, I think I'll just dive right into it. So, um, I just got back from another road trip. It was my last road trip of the year and uh, thought I would kind of show you what I picked up. I picked up a lot more than this, but just thought we'd show you a couple things here to start. So lately, instead of relying on antique shops and flea markets, which is usually what I do to find clubs, uh, I've been spending more time on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist looking ahead uh, when I know I'm going to be going somewhere and seeing what's uh, on the road on my way. So these two clubs I picked up in Pennsylvania, and this is going to be the trick here, trying to see if I can zoom these in. Uh, I should mention, too, you're going to notice that the uh, definition of this video is not going to be like my other videos. I'm using a webcam, uh, but I need a 1,000 subscribers to the channel to be able to use my phone. So uh, the phone's going to be, obviously, a much better camera. Uh, and that's just extra incentive to tell your friends about the channel so I can get up to a thousand subscribers and uh, give you guys the high definition you all deserve. Anyway, back to the club here. So this is a Gibson Stella. Um, it's a really cool shape club. It's actually a jigger and it's rustless. So what I've been kind of working on on the side right now is finding a set of clubs, like a short set of Scottish irons that are rustless so that I can play them in wet weather. Um, you know, I don't have a problem playing my other clubs in wet weather, but um, then I don't have to do all the maintenance stuff that you normally have to do with a non-rustless set after the round. So, you know, like any collector, I'm always finding excuses to buy more clubs and, and uh, this is the latest one. So I'm pretty excited to try this one out. The loft on this is 30 degrees. Not sure if that's shown up. Um, it's about an inch shorter than it should be for its loft. And um, if I put an inch, you know, add, add an inch with a splice um, extension or just put a different shaft in here, I can get it up to C9 at its appropriate um, long, loft and length. And that actually brings me to the first question I'm going to answer this week, which was a comment on a video. Um, let me grab my phone here real quick. It was a comment on the first Workshop Wednesday video, and it was somebody asking um, what the chart is that I use for figuring out what the length of the shaft should be in relation to its loft. Uh, the long answer to that is, well, I guess the answer to that is um, there is no chart. I made it up myself. Um, I know that other golfers have probably put together charts of their own. The one that I'm about to show you is based off of trial and error and just kind of observations from collecting clubs over the last two years. And I started to see some consistencies with length of club. Um, if I wanted, if I was aiming for D0, D1 swing weight, I would start to see that there is a specific length in relation to the loft that would get me to that ideal swing weight spot. So this chart that I'm going to show you here, and I'm actually going to um, put it up on the screen so you can take a screenshot of that yourself. That's the chart that I use. So that's the loft on be the left hand side. And on the right hand side is the length of shaft that would get that club to D0 or D1, just about that spot. So if he needs that chart again, 
Uh, just drop me a line in the comments. Uh, send me your your email. You can find my email address uh, in the description for the channel, but it's uh, Hickory Hacker. I think it's the Hickory Hacker at gmail.com, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'll send this to you again and give you more information if you need it. Uh, playing. So this length here is the playing length of the club when the shaft is in the in the club. So that's to say, when you've got a club, when you have a shaft, you you know the shaft length is the shoulder here to the butt end. So that's your that's the length you're going by. So this length right here, 34 and a half inches, that's the, this spot right here. So when I put this in ahead, you know, obviously this part's going in. The, the length is going to change um, depending on what club head you're putting in. That wasn't a good example. I'm not sure I'll find one that will fit on this perfectly. Well, that's close enough. But when you've got the shaft in there, then, I like to have a tape measure on my workbench like this, so all I have to do is lay the, the club down on the bench to measure it. And you're measuring to, it's it's a little tricky, not to where the club's, the head starts to bend, it's actually a little past that. So you wanna imagine that the heel of the club or the, uh, the shaft of the club is going down to the heel. So there's a little spot here that's pretty easy to tell. And when you look at the tape measure and then follow that up to the, where the sweet spot would be, that's how you know you've got the playing length figured out. So uh, that chart refers to the playing length when the head is on the shaft. So I hope that helps answer that a little bit. Um, but of course, if anybody's got any extra questions about that, feel free to ask and I'll clarify. Um, Next question I'll cover is going to be related to the project I work on a little bit later in this video. Uh, but how often do I break clubs? Um, I actually don't break clubs that often. Part of it is because I just don't have the swing speed that a lot of you know better players do, where you probably would break shafts a little bit more frequently. Um, I try to put a nice easy swing, but sometimes you know you you hit a, a different kind of you know weird lie where the club digs into the ground more than you want and that can break a shaft. Um, the answer to this question for me specifically is not that often, but there are two clubs uh, that I actually have broken multiple times and it's because the head is heavier than the shaft uh, can usually withstand. And you know, it's possibly why the, the club lasted this long through the years, um, it hasn't been played as much because people kept breaking the shaft that it was on, uh, hard to say, but uh, it's a great club. It's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, well, one of the two is one of my favorites, and it's Auto Hack Bar 2 Iron, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. I was actually playing around a couple, um, actually, this would have been, oh, a month and a half ago already, uh, Latrobe Country Club, and uh, broke it on a par three. Um, great shot, but I noticed that something was a little bit different when I finished the swing, and I looked down to see some cracks. So we're going to take a look at that, the whipping off, and see how bad the shaft uh, crack is, and then I'll show you how I repair that real quick. Um, that'll be the project for this live stream. But um, yeah, that's the one club. The other one is my Flange Mashie, which a lot of you have noticed is probably my favorite club in the bag up to this point with the videos uh, on the course vlogs. Uh, that's also a very heavy head, and you know you need a pretty stout to be able to you know keep that one uh, from breaking. And I've replaced that shaft twice. Um, so. Yeah, from my experience, it's just been with clubs where the head is a little bit heavier or a lot heavier than um, you normally find. But I like heavier clubs, so and I also know how to do the repairs at this point, so I'm comfortable playing it like I would always, you know, play it. You know, and if it breaks, I know how to fix it. So um, yeah, we'll get into the Tom Stewart a little bit later. Uh, the last thing I would just want to mention was uh, a thank you to everybody who's used the Hickory Hacker 21. Uh, promo code for Stuart and Jacoby. I was very excited to find out last week that uh, they've been sold out of the blue bag that I, the pencil bag that I used that I did the uh, video on uh, back in July. Uh, that was a big relief for me because I wasn't sure anybody was going to buy uh, anything I was trying to promote. Um, but it's a great bag. I love it. And those of you who have bought one uh, can attest to that as well. And I uh, just want to thank you for helping them go out of stock, basically, on that color. Now, that's to, that's to say there aren't other colors you can buy. And I definitely encourage you to check out stewardjacoby.com. Uh, use the promo code HickoryHacker21 for 10% off uh, anything in the store. 
And uh, yeah, just want to thank you guys for promoting or supporting a, um, a really cool uh, made in the USA business that's making high quality golf gear that you're not going to find anywhere else. All right. So I showed you the uh, Stella Jigger. I'm going to show you the other club that I picked up. This is the same person who was selling both of these clubs on Facebook Marketplace. So I was pretty excited when I saw the pictures and jumped on it pretty quick. Uh, this is a Huntley putter. Uh, it's made in, uh, made in England and uh, circa early 1920s, I believe. Um, this was actually made for the Abercrombie and Fitch company. So that was the distributor in uh, the US or the, you know, the store that it was probably sold through in New York City. Uh, the cool thing about this putter though is the patented shaft. Um, it's a paddle with a thumb groove in it. So um, it encourages a really comfortable grip and um, it's my favorite putter grip. Now, unfortunately, these Huntley putters are notoriously light. And so anybody who's been playing this usually has a lot of lead tape on the back of this. And, um, you know, just to kind of bring it up to a playable weight. It's just a really cool putter, though. And, um, you know, I'll disclose how much I paid for both of these clubs in the, the marketplace um, uh, offer. It was 30 bucks for both clubs. So not too bad for... A pickup that was on my on my way to where I was heading last week. Um, I already have one of these putters, so uh, this one's actually in much better shape. The uh, Huntley is got a better uh, stamping there. It's much clearer, much cleaner, uh, easier to see, and the shaft is actually dead straight. I mean, it's really, really a great shaft. So I'm gonna keep it all together uh, because you know this shaft belongs with this putter even though I really like these shafts and would like to try it in other clubs potentially. But um, if, if you wanna know more about the Huntley putter and the other example that I have, um, there's a video in my archive uh, where I just kind of show you a quick one minute video of how it, how it putts. And um, it, uh, that particular model or uh, example of the model has what's called the St. Andrews bend to the shaft that I describe or explain a little bit better in the video. So I encourage you to check that out. But anyway, that was cool. Um, I, I picked up a lot of other clubs that I'll show you in the future. Um, the other thing though, I wanted to show you right now are some golf balls. So after I did the, um, Let's see, it's actually before I did the pickup in Pennsylvania, I stopped at an antique shop in New Jersey. And um, I don't normally find any clubs at this antique shop, so I wasn't too optimistic. Uh, but I also had never really taken a closer look at the cases. You know, a lot of times when I'm looking for golf clubs, there's no point in wasting time looking in the, the glass cases that would be too small for a golf club. Uh, but I need to start doing that more often because uh, a bowl was sitting in there with some antique golf balls in it that caught my eye. And I'm guessing these have been there for a while and just nobody's noticed them, at least not people like me. Uh, but I ended up buying all of them. I, I, uh, there were 11 balls there and um, every single one of these is different. Um, I didn't have a golf ball collection really until I bought these balls uh, and uh, I'm super excited now to keep finding more. But I wanted to show you just a couple of my favorites here, if these will show up any. This is a long flash. I believe this was made by the Wanamaker Company. I need to do a lot of research on golf balls at this point. Um, I don't really know a lot of the companies that would have been making balls. There were a lot of them, obviously. Uh, there are a couple good resources that I have that I'll show you in the future, but that's showing up okay. I can't tell. I'm looking at my monitor. Yeah. So anyway, just a really cool mesh pattern. Um, I believe this one dates to 1923, something like that. Um, this is a cool one, too. I saw an example of this one on eBay, but it was called the Colonel, not the Shamrock. So I'm not sure what the story is with this one, but you can see the interesting dimple pattern there. It's kind of a, a mesh combined with some crescents so just a really interesting i mean these are just little pieces of you know works of art in my opinion but you can see there it says the shamrock that's showing up all right 
Boy, it's hard to figure out orientation here at the uh, camera. Anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. Cool, cool ball there. The last one I'll show you is this one, a U.S. Tiger with another interesting dimple pattern. This one is in really good shape compared to others that I've seen on eBay. So anyway, I've got a golf ball collection now. Um, for now, I'm going to hold on to them, but at some point, if I get some others, um, I might start offering these up for sale as well, uh, in addition to the clubs. All right. Moving along here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about as far as projects go is um, uh, there was another comment on a video. It was actually my club head rust removal in the Hickory Golf Club Repair Series um, where somebody said that they uh, prefer using uh, the method of chelation. I, chelation? I'm not sure exactly how you say that, um, but it's a different process than what vinegar does to a club. So it's not acidic. It's a different chemical process, uh, but it's supposed to be, you know, the products that use that process are supposed to be just as non-toxic as vinegar is and um, easy to use. And this person swore by it. So I'm always interested in other ways to do things that I've learned. Um, vinegar works great for me and um, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, so I didn't really, I don't really have a big reason to try something different um, from that perspective. Uh, but I'm always up to see if something works better or if it's quicker or if it requires less scrubbing, that kind of stuff. And that's supposedly what this certain product that I'm about to show you is supposed to do. It's called Evaporust. I'll grab it here, show you real quick. I picked this up at Harbor Freight. It's kind of pricey. So right off the bat, it's it's got a little bit of a disadvantage over vinegar in the price category. But... Um, Again, uh, you know, I'm up for trying it. A lot of times with really rusty clubs, you know, I'll have to let it sit in vinegar for three days sometimes. Um, and this is supposed to be quicker and require less scrubbing. So we're going to see. Um, I'm going to do a test. And I've got two clubs heads that I'm about to show you that are about the same amount of equal rust. And um, we're going to see. Next time I do a video, I'll show you the results. And... Uh, kind of weigh in on what I think is the better product um, to use for rust removal. So let's show you the, the two heads. So I'm kind of excited about these. This is kind of an extension of the fresh finds segment of the video. But um, I bought, trying to remember how many clubs were in it. I think it was 11 clubs and a bag from a guy, an antique dealer in Rhode Island. And uh, this is a couple weeks ago. I saw the pictures on... Um, I believe this was a marketplace find as well. And uh, there were a couple clubs in there that looked pretty interesting to me. There was a uh, Schenectady putter that had some hosel damage. Um, so, you know, it's not not really a collectible club at this point necessarily because of that damage, but still a cool club nonetheless. And then there are some others. And then, you know, a lot, with a lot of these listings, you can see one or two clubs really clearly, but then there's others in there that are you can't see the details of, and it's tantalizing. You're, you're just kind of wondering what else is in there. Well, these two kind of qualify as that, and um, I'll show you the one. These, these heads that I'm about to show you are both Tom Stewart heads. Uh, this is a mashy iron. Let's see if I can get that in focus. Yeah, pretty close. Not a lot that you can see right now because there's some fair a fair amount of rust on this. Um, but I checked the loft on it, it's 24 degrees, and with the appropriate length shaft in it, I think it's going to be about D1. So it, it'd be a pretty good player. Um, so this is the typical amount of rust that I normally find on, you know, attic or barn finds, things like that. Um, but I think this is going to clean up really well. It's not too pitted. There are some spots where it's pitted, but generally it's just a lot of surface rust, I think. So... I'm going to put that one in the evapo rust. Um, that way, if the evapo rust does something crazy <laughs> to the club, which I don't think it'll do, but if it does, um, then, you know, it's not a huge loss. Because this is a, a for what, what I can see on it, it's a Tom Stewart, and I'm a big fan of Stewart's, but I think it's an A.L. Johnson labeled club, which was a sporting goods store, a hardware store in Boston. 
So it's not like a necessarily, you know, rare club like this other one I'm about to show you. So this, if this zooms in appropriately, this is an Alex Smith labeled Stewart, kind of a lofter. I date both of these clubs to probably between 1912, 1915, something like that. I'm really excited about this one. Um, Alex Smith was, I believe, a two-time U.S. Open winner, um, part of a very successful and influential uh, group of brothers in the Hickory, or in early golf, Scottish brothers. There's Willie Smith, who also won the U.S. Open, and McDonald Smith. Um, but Alex Smith has a particular significance to me because he was the pro at Shenacoset golf course, which is where the Connecticut Hickory Golf Association had their first event. So I've been trying to find for my own personal collection, an Alex Smith club that I would play um, just to kind of commemorate, you know, his connection to Connecticut golf. And uh, I think I found that club here. This is 26 degrees uh, with the appropriate length shaft. It'll be about D0, D1. And uh, very excited to get this one uh, cleaned up. I can also, so I don't know if it zoomed in, but you know, well or not, but his signature is uh, right under here, but there's also another stamp with his name in it. And I'm really intrigued to see what the golf course is that he was working at when this club was made. Obviously that'll help us date it specifically. Um, but I've got my fingers crossed that it, it's Shenacoset. I'm not sure if there are any Shenacoset Alex Smith Stewart's out there, but Anyway, we're going to find out. This club's going to go in the traditional vinegar bath because I trust the vinegar. Um, I think it'll handle this rust fine, and uh, I don't expect anything weird to happen to it that would mess it up. So that'll be the test for the next Wednesday workshop. I'm going to show you how these two clubs turn out. I'm going to take some photos so we can get some really good before shots, and then we'll just compare. Uh, from what I understand, the evapo rust should get rid of the rust, but maintain the patina, which is the key. Um, when I'm doing these kinds of repairs or, or uh, restorations, I'm not trying to make these clubs look brand new. I'm just trying to get rid of the rust and uh, help them stay looking their age. So uh, evapo rust is supposedly, you know, capable of doing that. And I know the vinegar is. So we're going to find out. All right. So I got somebody commented here. Okay. Well, thanks for that comment. Uh, I think it's uh, your golf, um, URO golf. I'm going to mess up these uh, usernames. Uh, he says, I've had some luck with using Barkeeper's Friend and light scrubbing with steel wool. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Um, I guess the thing with me, and I don't know the chemical composition of Barkeeper's Friend. I'm sure it's probably fine. But vinegar there's no toxicity to it whatsoever you can get it on the hand on your hands even though it, it smells i don't i use i use gloves when i'm working with it um but i guess the big thing with me has just always been that's what i first learned how to do um and you know if you're if you're starting out with hickory golf repair and things um you're going to kind of rely on what your teachers tell you in the beginning and um as you go, you start to figure out what works better for you, and you start to take chances with stuff more. And again, the first person that told me anything about clubhead rust re removal was using vinegar, and I don't, I've never had an issue using it. So this is more of a test to me to see what else is out there that uh, in a pinch, if I can't find vinegar for whatever reason, you know, I got this evapor rust, but you know, again, I think the vinegar cost me 350 or four bucks for the, the, the gallon jug. I've got, and this evapo rust is, I want to say, it's a gallon as well. Yeah, but it was $30. So I don't know. I mean, it's going to have to basically get rid of the rust in, you know, a really, you know, short fraction of the time that the vinegar does in order for me to make it feel like it's worth it. Uh, but thanks for the, the, the comment. You know, there are a lot of ways to get rid of rust on clubs. Um, I'm... I'll say this one more, you know, one more thing about rust removal. Um, a lot of guys have tried different things and they're, they're satisfied with how they work. Uh, but I have run into situations where somebody's done a process to a club to get rid of rust that turns off another collector because it's been overworked. It's too, it looks too nice. It looks too new. 
And um, the vinegar has always been right in that sweet spot of getting rid of the rust, but maintaining the patina, uh, which no collector ever has an issue with. They don't want to see rust on the club. They want to see age. Um, and vinegar does a really good job of getting rid of the rust but while maintaining the patina. So that's why I've been hesitant to try other things that might really get rid of the rust, but also might start to polish it up somehow or, you know, I don't know. Um, I'm just very, very hesitant about doing things to clubs that could detrimentally affect their value to someone else down the line, especially if I choose not to play the club anymore and it becomes more of a, a wall hanger for someone. Um, so that's just kind of my, my philosophy toward rust removal. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of things out there that are totally fine. I just haven't used them yet. So I don't have any personal experience to draw on when I'm talking about this other than vinegar and eventually here a vapor rust. Okay. Um, so let's get into the shaft repair. I'm going to reach around the camera here. So if you've been watching my course vlogs, you know that I use this club a lot. This is 25 degrees and it's my go-to for any shot that's basically 160 yards or longer. Um, I really like this club. I found this club in a batch of, let's see, there were four other clubs and I believe I, I this was part of a New Hampshire find. Drove all the way up to New Hampshire and uh, no, no, I'm sorry. This was a uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts. Um, it was three clubs for 50 bucks. So it was this one and then two, uh, two uh, wood uh, brassies. Uh, one was a Gibson Dreadnought, uh, which I'll show you in a different video. Um, I still have that. The other was made by a uh, company in Chicago that was short-lived in 1920, about 1920. And um, it's a splice neck. So it's a very late era splice neck um, that I sold. So I don't have that club anymore, but I kept this one. So I basically sold the uh, splice neck and it paid for the clubs that I was able to keep, which is always kind of like my criteria for buying clubs where there's one I know I want to keep. Um, so let's take a closer look at the crack in this, if this will show up. So you can start to you can see it a little bit. Yeah, it's starting to come through a bit, a bit better. So it cracked in two spots, which concerns me a little bit because this may not be as straightforward uh, repair as I've shown how to do in my other videos. Uh, I'm going to take the whipping off here and I'm going to really see how much we've got going on. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I guess I could have taken the whipping off before the video. Oh, a little safety thing here. When you're using knives in the workshop, I always like to have these gloves on. You know, if it's really sharp, it's going to poke through no matter what. But this kind of saves you from where the, you know, the knife might slip. I mean, I'm telling you something you already know. I'm going to adjust this a little bit so that you can actually see the stand. Look at the... Uh, We'll get the uh, camera angles figured out here in the future. Uh, another thing is, I'll often try to save longer stretches of whipping. This one's kind of a moderate length, but it might still be salvageable. Um, you know, whipping's kind of expensive, and if, if it's mostly in, you know, that's a pretty long stretch for going above a putter or, you know, may not be enough for a uh, kind of a strength spot where you're trying to put some whipping, but I've got a whole drawer here full of uh, whipping that I've taken off and saved. Kind of hoarding whipping right now. Um, this piece is a little bit, this section's a little longer, so this will actually definitely be salvageable. A um, couple people have uh, been uh, talking to me about doing uh, their own whipping, and um, one person in particular, Chris Berry, uh, tried to do this without a whipping stand and was successful. It looks great, 
but um, definitely figured out, I think, the benefit of uh, what, a, what a stand can do for you by having some stability. Uh, this is from Hickory Golf Workshop. I definitely recommend this. They put a lot of, you know, it's, it's just really sturdy for a lot of different projects, but um, you could make your own too if you wanted. Um, I don't know. I like supporting Hickory Golf Workshop though, uh, because, you know, a lot of the stuff that they have is, is hard to source elsewhere. And it's just good to support the people in the hobby. Um, all right. So what I like to do with these cracks is just, you know, really kind of flex it and, and test it and see where it is. This is unlike any crack I've actually encountered because it's, it's kind of a compound fracture. Um, I'm going to try to fix it. Because, you know, worst case scenario is if it, it breaks again and I just have to replace the shaft. But if it if it holds, you know, for another several rounds, then then it was worth the time to do it. Um, I think the best way for me to approach this one. You're going to watch me do something that's somewhat experimental here. Um, not experimental, but I don't have a ton of experience doing this and I got to be careful. Um, what I'm going to do, I can find the plug for the, let's see, what do I want to unplug here? I'll unplug that for a second. Fortunate that my workshop's got four plugs there. Okay. What I'm going to do is very, very carefully on a low setting, heat up the area where the crack is. What this is going to do is make the wood easier to, um, kind of manipulate and open up the crack even further so that I can get some toothpicks in there, which I'm going to grab here. So I can keep the crack open and get the super glue down in there. This will also help kind of expose more of the crack that I can't see right now just by trying to bend it myself. But the thing is you got to be real careful with this method because you can very easily char the wood. So you got to take your time. It's going to be kind of loud. I'm not going to do this very long. I just kind of want to heat this up a little bit so that I can make it a little bit more, um, a little softer, more manipulatable. That, that's a word. So I can already start to see the charring. And I'm not, I do this with woods. Uh, this is how I kind of expose the cracks on a socket. And it, it works pretty well. I haven't actually tried it on the shaft of an iron. You definitely want to be wearing gloves with this as well because you could accidentally touch the spot that you've been heating up, which I know from experience is, isn't fun. So I can already start to see the crack actually expanding a little bit. So I know this is actually working. Trying real careful not to char the wood. I can see it starting to get a little darker there. I don't want to do more than that. All right, I'm going to test that and see. Yeah, it probably needs more. This is where it helps to have two people. If you've got a hickory golf buddy that uh, wants to come over someday, they can, you know, do this flex, and then you can jab the uh, toothpicks in there to kind of keep it open. I'm going to try this a little bit longer and see if I can get it to open up wider. It seems to be, um, yeah, that's definitely making it softer. This could take a while, though. <laughs> Let's see if I can get a toothpick in there. I may not do this entire repair on the uh, video here because this, this might be tedious to watch. 
Yeah, but that's actually doing what I was hoping. So you can sort of see right there. Got enough of a gap now where the crack is to get that toothpick in there. And what that's going to allow me to do is let some super glue flow in. Now, as I was doing that with the heat, um, I didn't really see that. It looks like I basically have one large kind of uh, splinter here. So it um, the crack starts about here, comes down, opens up. There's a flap here, and then it comes back this way. So what I'm going to do is get some super glue and just let it flow down as deep as I can in there. Try to get this a little bit further in. There we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. Now you can really see that crack open up. Now let me get that deep in there. And I'm going to fix this repair first. Um, there's another crack that I can see below where I was just showing you. Um, but I can't get that to flex open. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on with that, but uh, I can see this one. So we're going to fix this one and then see where that gets us. So let's get the super glue out here. So this is what I, I like to use. Loctite, very thin, free flowing. Makes your eyes burn if you're not in a ventilated area. So keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, this is the tricky part. There's probably a better way to do this, but I don't know what it is. I just try to get in behind the toothpick. See if I can do this at an angle where you can see. Get my big hands out of the way there. That's a little better. All right. So I'm just kind of flowing this in to the crack, going down the side, trying not to glue the uh, toothpick in place. And then I'll get above the toothpick here because that's where, you know, the flap is. Then I got to quickly get this toothpick out. Without breaking it. Let's do this. There we go. All right. Now, what I do real quick to get this started, it's just a little mini clamp here, and I'm just going to press down on the flap. Should have done this actually ahead of time, what I'm about to show you. Um, it's nice to have strapping tape like this already pre-cut. So all you got to do is grab it and wrap it around the crack. Because what we're going to do is take a few strips of this. I'll just get all my strips at once here. This is the thing that I've, you know, I've noticed um, <laughs> with my repairs. And this happens to me when I'm trying to cook dinner too. I don't plan ahead at what I might need in the moment. So I, you know, if I've got something that's drying or whatever, and I need to do something else to it quickly, I don't have the other things ready. So just like cooking and, and properly preparing a meal, make sure you've had all your ingredients prepared and set out. So you all got to do is grab it. Just don't make the same mistakes that I make with this stuff. All right. So I got three pieces here and I'm going to start on the bottom. Try not to get any of the glue on my fingers, which I've done in the past. And then real tight here, wrap it around and then make a little flap. So you can pull that off tomorrow. Put another one on here. Okay. It's pretty tight. Yeah, the good news is it's not making my eyes burn today. Benefit of having a ventilated room. Okay. I got a tab. Now I get the heavier duty clamps here. Actually, get a paper towel and just kind of clean up some of the excess that's dripped down. Oof, got a lot on there. That'll clean up. I'll be able to get that off. <laughs> All right. So now I want to make sure I've got the orientation 
of the clamp on there correctly. I gotta pull this up just to see where my flap is. There we go. Okay. I'm kind of remembering that. And if you do that right, you'll um, you'll see some excess kind of squeeze out the side of the crack. I think I saw somewhere just recently that um, this stuff is so strong that you don't normally need to clamp it like this, but I don't know. I guess it's just kind of a mental thing. It makes me feel like it's going to be stronger if I've clamped it um, tight, and I don't think it hurts anything, obviously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this sit now um, all day, uh, and then tomorrow morning I'll come back, take the strapping tape off, and then I'll test it. And um, in the next workshop video, I'll kind of show you and we'll see if that actually held. Get this uh, out of the way here. All right. Okay. That's what I had planned for this first workshop or live from the workshop uh, video. Um, I wanted to do this kind of quietly, but uh, in the future, I'll kind of give people a heads up when I do it. It'll always be a Wednesday, uh, probably early afternoon, Eastern time. Uh, I won't say exactly what time right now because it'll change. Um, but uh, yeah, I the other thing I can't do is give people notification or extra notice, I think, um, through a post on YouTube. I can't do that until I have a certain number of subscribers. But what I think I can do is schedule the live stream and um, YouTube might be able to or might send out some kind of notification that there's a scheduled live stream or something. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see how that goes. But one way you can find out for sure is by following me on Instagram and Facebook if you're not already. Um, my Instagram is the one I post to most frequently. And that's at Hickory Hacker. Uh, hold on. I got another comment here. Ah, yeah, Chris said he, the bag is great. He he was the first person I knew about uh, who used the promo code to buy the bag. So, yeah, I'm really glad you're enjoying it, Chris. It is a great bag. Um, and uh, thanks for, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think at this point, though, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the workshop I could show you, but I'll try to keep this tight and tidy. We've been going for about 42 minutes. I think that's probably a good first video. If there are any technical issues that, you know, you, you noticed, I'll try to figure those out, but as far as I can tell right now, this is the best I can do right now until I can use the phone uh, when I've got a thousand subscribers. So please tell your friends uh, what's going on over here and uh, let's get to a thousand subscribers so I can up the definition on the video and, and get the, uh, the overhead camera going again. Um, yeah, and anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I'll be back next week. Um, I'm actually playing Yale Golf Course tomorrow, and I'm real excited about it. I'm not entirely sure I'm going to be able to do a video of that course or do a course vlog for that one, but I'm going to try. Um, so that's where I'm going to be tomorrow playing. Um, but the next video to come up, course vlog-wise, is going to be La Sonia. Real excited about that one as well. So stay tuned next week for that first uh, for the first video of that, the front nine. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you next time.